How many of you have found yourself at odds with another brother or sister at some point in your walk in the truth? Perhaps it was a simple misunderstanding that grew into a larger issue. Or perhaps it wasn't a misunderstanding at all, and there was a real grievance that we committed against somebody else. Or perhaps we were on the receiving end of somebody else's non-ideal behavior. Left unaddressed, these issues can fester and grow like a canker that rots at the fabric of our relationship with that brother or sister. And we find ourselves knowing that the current state of that relationship is not good, but we find ourselves feeling powerless of how do we move that forward to get from a not good to something better, to something that enables us to walk together on the pathway that leads to life. This can be a real challenge, especially if the grievous is, or the, the thing that's done, the grievance is severe enough because it hurts deeply, doesn't it, when misunderstandings occur or when wrongs are committed one direction or the other. It's been said that time heals all wounds, but if the damage is inflicted that's severe enough, we can find that instead of healing, that time simply cements and hardens the damage that's been done. And we associate that harm, that pain, reflexively with that brother or sister every time we interact with them. Well, Paul found himself in the middle of such a situation. Not a situation that he had created in this case, but a situation that he was asked to help resolve. Paul was now in this middle of a highly charged emotional issue with high stakes. High stakes that really affected the salvation of two brethren as they found themselves at odds. And we may not always see it with this level of severity of when we're at odds with another brother or sister that it truly impacts our salvation. But the reality is that it does. Consider the words of the Lord Jesus Christ when he says in Matthew chapter 5, verses 22 to 24, But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. Therefore, if I bring thy gift to the altar, and there remember that thy brother hath aught against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. Or consider the words in 1 John chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. He that saith he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness even until now. He that loveth his brother abides in the light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in them. Or in 1 John 4, verses 20 and 21, that if a man say, I love God, and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God loveth his brother also. And so we can see and we can remind ourselves of the significance that God attaches to when there is disparity, when there is a lack of unity between brethren. And the beauty of what we have in Philemon's letter, or Paul's letter to Philemon, is that it presents to us a concise template for how brethren could be reconciled. Because doubtless as this issue was presented at Paul's feet, that he appealed to God, that the Spirit might guide him on what he should say, and how he could aid these two brethren to join back together, to work together, to walk together as brethren toward the kingdom. And so what I'd like to do this evening is to consider this letter together such that we might gain greater insight as to how we could approach issues between ourselves. What approach that we've seen the Spirit reveal to us as to how we can best work through differences which we know ultimately will occur that doubtless each of us have encountered difficulties between each other and will undoubtedly, if our Lord tarries, encounter more in the future. And so that's really the hope this evening, is to take a look at this and perhaps through the course of time even be inspired to address some of those issues that might be lingering, that might be sitting out there, that we know are there but are just seemingly too difficult to address.
So when we take a look at the letter to Philemon, this is just a proposed outline in the way in which we're going to cover it this evening. That Paul starts with the positive in verses 1 through 7. He then enters into a constructive appeal in verses 8 to 21, and then concludes with the blessing of God in verses 22 to 25. And this epistle is short enough that we can cover it in one evening together, that we can really dive into it and really try to understand the approach that is used here in bringing Philemon and Onesimus together. So let's go ahead and start then at verse 1. In verse 1, Paul mentions himself as a prisoner of Jesus Christ. In fact, he mentions this twice in the letter, that he was a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ in verse 1 and in verse 9. This is a different way of introducing himself than what he did, for example, in the letter to the Colossians, of where he demonstrated some apostolic authority. But instead, he's making a personal appeal here based on his relationship in Christ to Philemon. And by using this term, there's actually a link that he's creating between Onesimus and himself. Paul is a prisoner, desmios, and Onesimus is a slave, doulos. And both words come from the same root, dio, which means to bind or to be in bonds. And Paul saw a similarity between his state of being in bonds for the gospel to the state of Onesimus as being a bond slave in his current plight in life. And he seems to be appealing to Philemon on this basis. Paul uses a similar word in verse 13 when he refers to his own bonds, the fact that Onesimus was ministering to him while he was struggling and under house arrest. So having positioned himself with some type of connection to Onesimus, he also connects to Philemon as well, because at the end of verse 1, he talks to Philemon and refers to him as our dearly beloved and fellow laborer. This term fellow laborer is a term of equality. This isn't the Apostle Paul going to tell the convert, the Colossian convert Philemon, this is what you need to do in this situation. This is Paul appealing to a fellow laborer to one of equality, trying to inspire him from within on what he should be doing to pursue forward and to come to some type of reconciliation. But Paul doesn't just reach out to Philemon. He reaches out to Aphia, who many believe is Philemon's wife, and Archippus, who is likely Philemon's son, who seems to have some ecclesial responsibility given the fact that he's referred to and referenced in Colossians 4 and verse 17 of where Paul encourages him to fulfill the charge that was given to him, to make sure that he completed the responsibility that he had. Many have concluded that Aphia and Archippus were direct family members because when he writes to Philemon, it's clear that the ecclesia was meeting in Philemon's home, as we can see there at the end of verse 2. And since this was a personal letter that was delivered to Philemon, some have pondered, well, it would make sense then that his wife and son would be included in this appeal as he wrote to this household. It was common for ecclesias to meet in the household of individuals. We can read about this in Romans 16 and verse 5 with Aquila and Priscilla that the ecclesia met in their home. We have Nympha of Laodicea recorded in Colossians 4 and verse 15. Peter and Andrew with Christ in Mark 1 and verse 29. And here we have Philemon in Colossae in Philemon verse 2. And so having introduced himself as an equal and appealing to him in loving terms, he then expresses his positive intent toward Philemon. You can see a pattern in many of Paul's writings as he's inspired by the Spirit to follow this divine pattern. You can see in verse 3 that he expresses the desire for grace and peace to rest upon Philemon and upon his house, the extension of God's undeserved favor to the extent that the peace, according to righteousness, might be fulfilled. And he communicates in verse 4 that he regularly prays for Philemon's welfare. And he actually gives God thanks specifically for Philemon. Paul had a genuine interest in Philemon, Philemon's family, his welfare, not only now, but his eternal welfare, and wanting him to be to the kingdom. And he uses terms of endearment to introduce himself to them. And it's so important, as we mentioned before, to give thanks for each other, to pray genuinely on each other's behalf, and establishing up front this positive intent that we have one toward the other, which causes us to question, 
Do we really want to be in the kingdom with each other, even when we find ourselves at odds with each other? Do we still think in our minds, I need to work through this. We need to work through this, because if we're going to work together in the kingdom forever, then we need to be able to resolve the differences that we're experiencing now. And if we can't answer yes to that question, that we want to serve together in the kingdom, then we need to explore why that's the case and begin to work through that on this side of the kingdom is some of the counsel that we're receiving here as we read through Paul's appeal to Philemon. He then goes on in verse 5 to commend the attitude and the spirit of Philemon's service. He now transitions to commend Philemon for his love, hearing of thy love and thy faith, which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus and toward all saints, that the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. And so he talks about his love, his faith, his service in the ecclesia, and in so doing, there's a play on Philemon's name because the root for Philemon is filio, which means love. And Philemon was a friendly individual, as his name means. He seems to have a reputation for that. And so what Paul's doing is he's appealing to his reputation, that I know that you're a friendly, a loving individual, as is manifested by your example in the ecclesia. And you've shown love toward all the saints. And what he's doing here is he's setting the scene. He's talking about the reputation that Philemon had for showing love to others before he introduces Onesimus, an individual who desperately needed the love of Philemon and the forgiveness of Philemon for the wrong that he had committed against him. Onesimus was desperately in need of this love, and Paul says, I've been praying that you'll continue to show this love moving forward. What's really interesting is this word effectual in verse 6, that the communication of thy faith may become effectual, it actually carries with it the meaning of being active, that you will continue to put in action the faith that you have, the faith that you've been demonstrating in love toward the other brothers and sisters, that you'll continue to demonstrate it in the face of this challenge that I'm going to present to you. But note here that Paul isn't presenting the issue. He's not leading with the issue. Instead, Paul is actually leading with the positive. And all too often we lead with what's bothering us. We carry around what's bothering us for so long. It's like steam that just builds up pressure over time. It's just building up to the point of where we're ready to burst. And finally, when we confront somebody, we rely on the crutch of emotion to drive us to address something that should have been addressed before. And as soon as we open up the pot, just to begin speaking, steam overflows and scathes the other individual that we're trying to be effective with and we ruin the opportunity to have effective dialogue because we've waited too long. It's built up, and we've led with the issue. The priority has been getting the issue off of our chest as opposed to thinking about how to present the issue in a way that will best promote the righteousness of God and lead us to true unity, one with the other. Paul is much more measured, establishing common ground, building good rapport, and goodwill before even bringing up Onesimus' name. Onesimus isn't actually even named until verse 10. And so when approaching a tough situation, it's good to remember to think about some of the positive things concerning our brother or sister, concerning some of the things that they've done. Because look at what Paul here does here. As he goes on in verse 7 to presume positive intent, we have great joy and consolation in thy love, because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. He sees what Philemon is doing for the ecclesia. He knows that Philemon's intent is good toward the brethren. He doesn't say, well, Philemon, I, I think you were trying to do the wrong thing here. You were oppressing this individual. That's why they ran away from you. There's no accusations here that Paul lists out. Instead, he finds positive elements to try to inspire Philemon to be able to show the spirit of Christ moving forward. And so perhaps a challenge for us is when we're facing a difficult situation with another brother or sister, to try to think about a positive aspect of that brother or sister, to genuinely think of something that they do well, and to think of specific examples of where that item is demonstrated, such that when we think of that brother or sister, it's not just the inequity that we have in terms of what's taken place, 
but there's something positive to build off of, something to grow from, a foundation to begin to rebuild a relationship that has perhaps become broken. It goes a long way to know that even if we don't find ourselves on the same page as somebody else, that there is the intent to walk together toward the kingdom. Because if we can communicate our intent, and both of us want to get to the same place, and we have that assurance, then it allows us to build on that relationship and rebuild it as we both pursue the kingdom. Because if we're both pursuing the same destination, even if we find ourselves in different places, the love of Christ will constrain us and bring us back together as we work toward that common destination. This brings us to verse 8. But before taking a look at verse 8, let's just recap on a few of the points that have come out from the positive beginning that Paul posits as he speaks to Philemon. He starts with loving greetings, using terms of equality, showing that he is a fellow laborer, a fellow servant with Philemon in this case. He greets the family by name with endearing terms, showing them that he really cares about them. As you move forward into verses 3 and 4, there's the expression of positive intent toward each other. He prays for God's grace, his peace. He gives thanks for them. And he tells others that he wants them to succeed. And he really means it. He recognizes and commends for the attitude and the spirit of service that he sees. And it's important for us to acknowledge efforts when we see them and the impact of other people's work and the truth. And he expresses the desire for those efforts to continue moving forward. And he presumes positive intent of others' motivation and communicates areas where he's seen that. And the challenge to us is to do likewise, to look for the positive in our brothers and sisters, to begin with what can be constructive as we move into a constructive appeal, as we seek to promote unity. And so having laid a positive foundation, Paul now begins to constructively appeal to Philemon. And this begins in verses 8 and 9. Paul shares with Philemon that he's been weighing out through the Spirit which direction to choose. Paul knows that he could be bold, that he could use his apostolic authority to say, Philemon, this is what you need to do. But though he was bold enough in Christ to tell Philemon what he needed to do, Paul didn't feel that that was appropriate in this situation. Instead of making a demand, he makes a loving appeal. And since Philemon was apt to show the love of Christ to everyone, as he already established in verse 5, Paul sees it fitting to appeal in verse 9 based on love's sake. Yet for love's sake I rather beseech thee, being such an one as Paul the aged, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. There's a certain value if we can appeal to others based on the love of Christ. Not in a way that shows that the individual is not demonstrating the love of Christ, like, hey, if you were really showing the love of Christ, you'd be doing this. But in a way that inspires an individual to be able to move forward. Just like Paul does here with Philemon. To show an example of where Philemon had done this and to appeal to him to continue to do so moving forward. To continue to show that love of Christ. This creates a desire internally, intrinsic motivation to do the right thing versus being compelled or constrained from the outside. And Paul as the aged, Paul as one that has had experience in the truth, has seen the godly wisdom over time of this type of approach, of helping somebody work toward a solution, work toward a decision versus demanding what it is that they should do in a particular situation. In verse 10, Paul finally introduces Onesimus and the issue at hand. And when Paul introduces the issue, he addresses it directly. He acknowledges its existence. He doesn't pretend like the issue doesn't exist, and he doesn't downplay it. He uses very frank terms when he speaks to Philemon here. He's appealing now for Philemon to show kindness to his son in the faith. And this would be a different perspective, for sure, from what Philemon was experiencing. Because you think about the legal situation. Legally, Philemon was actually owning Onesimus. Onesimus was the property of Philemon. That was the law of the land. But now, now a different situation is being presented to Philemon to consider. Paul is saying, I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds. 
Paul's saying, this is actually my son. I've begotten him by my bonds. He was baptized under my watch, that he came to me, and I have borne him through the Spirit by baptizing him into the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so now this is a father who is appealing to a master on behalf of his son. A totally different paradigm than perhaps what Philemon was thinking when Onesimus originally ran away. And in so doing, we can see what Paul is trying to communicate. He's not diluting the issue, but he addresses it straightforwardly in verse 11. He says, which in time past was to thee unprofitable, but now profitable to thee and to me. Paul, just like he has a play on the name of Philemon, also has a play on the name of Onesimus. Onesimus means profitable. But he uses the opposite of that here when he speaks concerning Onesimus. He says, I knew that in time past he was unprofitable. So he says he wasn't living up to his name. In fact, Paul uses the same Greek word two times in this short phrase to say that not only was he unprofitable, but he was totally useless. He says, I know in times past he was totally useless. He said, look, I get it. I understand, Philemon. This is what you were dealing with before. I'm not trying to pretend that an issue doesn't exist. This is what you were dealing with when Onesimus ran away from you. But he's going on to present that something is different than it was before. It's very important that when we're addressing issues with each other, that we don't downplay the issue, that we don't pretend that an issue doesn't exist, but that we address it directly and straightforwardly in a loving way. Because the only thing that that does, if we dilute an issue or pretend that it doesn't exist or downplay it, is it causes us to lose credibility with the person that we're trying to communicate to. And it dilutes our ability to be effective because the other person feels that we just don't understand where they're coming from, don't understand their perspective. And Paul sees it as Philemon saw it through the Spirit and is able to present it back to him as to the way that Onesimus was and the type of servant that he was when he left his household. Well, Paul goes on to personally vouch for Onesimus at the end of verse 11. He says that despite the fact that he was unprofitable before, he is now profitable both to thee and to me. I've seen the evidence that he's now living up to his name. He's now a changed man. And Paul speaks in this regard, saying, this is what he's done for thee. I'm sending him to you again, that thou therefore might receive him. That is, mine own bowels. He's been helpful to me, and I want to send him back to you. It's not just a slave that's returning, but Paul says, it's mine own bowels. It's a part of me. Onesimus is now a part of me. He's part of who I am, and I'm presenting him back to you, such that you can do the right thing before God. Just as you have refreshed the bowels of the saints, as he says to Philemon in verse 7, so too he's appealing to Philemon to refresh him. In verse 13, you can imagine that Philemon might be somewhat dubious regarding these claims of change. If Onesimus was so great, if he was such a, a wonderful servant, then why is Paul sending him back to me, he might wonder. Well, Paul says that he found Onesimus so valuable that he was actually hoping that Onesimus could stay. That in place of Philemon, he could actually continue to serve him while he was under house arrest in Rome. But Paul wasn't just going to take Onesimus. He realized that there was a wrong that Onesimus had committed against Philemon. And so he didn't see fit to make that decision for Philemon, to just take his servant and to use him as his own. But instead, he sends him back and gives Philemon the opportunity to make the right decision. When addressing an issue, it's important to demonstrate not just that we're sorry or to acknowledge the issue, but to try to communicate how things are going to be different. Because if the person can see that what was the issue is no longer going to be the issue moving forward, that changes have been put in place, that a real effort is being applied to be different than what it was before, then it goes a long way in reconciliation. And that's what Paul is doing here through the Spirit, as he's displaying, showing the evidence, vouching, putting his own name down and saying, look, Onesimus is different than the way that he was before. Not only am I sending him back to you, but I'm sending him back to you 
as a different individual. And the evidence of that, I've seen it. I've seen it in the way that he's been serving me. And so reconciliation isn't just saying sorry and moving on. It's a mutual effort on the part of everyone involved to move forward in a better way, to walk together toward the kingdom. Both parties trying to pursue the same goal. But as Paul is desperately wanting this to take place, and he's appealing in a loving way to Philemon, he doesn't want to force the decision. He doesn't want to make it for him. He knows that Philemon has to make this decision. And so he says a similar message to what he said in verses 8 and 9, because remember in verses 8 and 9 he says, look, I could be bold, I could tell you what you need to do, but I'd much rather appeal to you in love. And so in verse 14, he says, but without thy mind would I do nothing, that thy benefit should not be as it were of necessity, but willingly. Paul doesn't lord his authority over Philemon to make a decision. Paul is trying to set an example here for Philemon. That if he doesn't want Philemon to lord his earthly authority over Onesimus, when Onesimus comes back in the way that he's received, then Paul is not going to lord his apostolic authority over Philemon and pressing him to make a decision. And we know that when we communicate with each other, if we press too hard to try to force a decision based on something that we think is correct, even if we're guided by the Spirit as Paul was, it can lead to resentment. It can lead to somebody not being full-hearted or wholehearted in their ability to be able to move forward. Because after all, as we know from 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 7, God loves a cheerful giver. And Paul was very interested in making sure that Philemon had the right spirit as he embraced Onesimus. And so he attempts to refocus the mind of Philemon as he communicates to him. He's looking for Philemon to accept Onesimus back into the ecclesia. And he suggests here that this might actually be the providence of God at work, seeking to elevate the mind of Philemon above just the fact that he was wronged, above the natural situation to say, well, maybe the providence of God is at work here. See what he says in verse 15, for perhaps he therefore departed for a season that thou shouldest receive him forever. You think about the situation before. Even though Philemon had Onesimus physically in his household, what type of servant was Onesimus anyway? What type of servant is somebody who despises their servitude, who doesn't want to be there, who does the absolute minimum to avoid being punished or disciplined? It wasn't a good situation before, and Paul's saying, look at the positive. God could have actually been orchestrating this whole thing, not just so that you'd get back a servant who would serve you better than he did before, Philemon, but so that you can have a brother, so that you can have a companion as you walk toward the kingdom together. If we can do this for each other, to try to raise our minds above the mundane, the hurt as acute as it may be in that situation, to see how God might be working in that situation, to bring both of us toward the kingdom, we're going to be a lot better off. And that's what we see Paul doing here through the Spirit, is bringing this point out and helping Philemon and Onesimus to see God's hand at work. In verse 16, he says, Not now as a servant, but above a servant, a brother beloved, specially to me, but how much more unto thee, both in the flesh and in the Lord. You're getting back a better servant, but not just a bond slave, a brother Philemon, he's coming back to you. He's going to benefit you moving forward. It's in your best interest to receive him, to receive him into the ecclesia. This would have been a real challenge when you think about it because the ecclesia met in Philemon's household. And if this individual, this issue was not reconciled between these two brethren, it could pose a major challenge to the unity and to the harmony of the ecclesia. And so he says, please receive him back into the ecclesia not just as a bond slave, but as a brother in Christ, as a brother in good standing. And he continues on to, to personally invest in the receipt of Onesimus, Paul does, in verses 17 to 19. He says, if you count me therefore a partaker, receive him as myself. It's almost as though Paul knew that Philemon would be struggling 
And Paul puts himself on the line, saying, okay, maybe you think that Philemon doesn't deserve another chance. But if you're not going to do it for Philemon's sake, do it for my sake. Do it as though you're receiving me because I'm giving him back to you as an extension of myself. Paul was in bonds. He couldn't return. But he's saying, I'm sending you back Philemon, my son that I've born in the spirit. Mine own bowels, a core part of who I am. And so receive him as you're receiving me. And you can think about where Paul would have received this spirit from, this instruction that the Lord Jesus Christ says in Matthew 25, that if you've done it unto the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me, appealing, using the teaching and spirit of Christ to help push Philemon forward. In verses 18 and 19, there's a rather curious phrase that comes up as to where Paul is writing. It seems that Paul would be dictating this letter to Timothy or Onesimus, that they would be writing this down. But now Paul goes to very clear and uncertain terms to distinguish for Philemon that now he was writing this with his own hand. And so Philemon would be reading along. He'd be looking at the text. There'd be one type of writing, one individual, one style of handwriting, and suddenly a different style of handwriting would appear in the letter. And he'd wonder, what's going on here? Not now as a servant, we read in verse 16, but above a servant, a brother beloved, specially to me, and how much more unto thee, both in the flesh and in the Lord. If, the, if thou count me therefore a partner, receive him as myself. If he hath wronged thee, or oweth thee aught, put that on mine account. I, Paul, have written it with mine own hand. I will repay it. Albeit, I do not say to thee how thou owest unto me even thine own self besides. Yea, brother, let me have joy of thee in the Lord. Refresh my bowels in the Lord. And so Paul plucks the pen, as it were, out of the hand of Onesimus or Timotheus and begins to write himself. And he says, I'm giving you the, the confidence and the security that if he owes you anything, I will personally repay what he owes to you. Paul was willing to make more tents. He was willing to do whatever it takes to ensure that Onesimus could be forgiven. He was personally invested in the unity of his brethren to make sure that whatever it took, he was there to push it forward. He was personally invested. But Paul does remind Philemon not to get, forget the fact that Philemon's own personal salvation and redemption from slavery to sin had been procured by Paul's preaching. And it's almost as though Paul is referencing the reading that we read today in Matthew chapter 18, the parable of the unforgiving servant as he reminds Philemon that, well, as Christ to the Gentiles, you have been forgiven by my preaching an unforgivable debt, something that you could never repay. Make sure that you keep that in mind as you're thinking about what Onesimus owes you. And it's important that we keep that in mind as we think about what others may owe us as it pertains to wrongs in this life. That if God could continue to work with sinful individuals throughout time, even unto the end, and if Christ could work with Judas, even until the end, then what excuse do we have? Now that doesn't mean that the wrongs that we commit against each other are insignificant. Even that parable that Christ uses in Matthew 18 demonstrates that. The man who owed the other man money owed him a hundred days wages. A hundred days wages is pretty much a third of a year's worth of wages. That's a pretty significant debt that we can be indebted one toward the other. But when you compare that against what we owe God and what God has forgiven us through Christ, it's insignificant because what we have owed is insurmountable. And Paul is appealing to Philemon to remember that. Well, think about the natural reaction that Philemon could have had as Onesimus returns to him. This would have been an embarrassment to a certain extent to Philemon. Onesimus runs off. He doesn't really know where he's gone, but presumably he's stolen something to enable him to be able to go forward, in this case, to Rome. Rome was a long journey, and Paul even infers this, that if he hath wronged thee or owed thee anything, inferring that Onesimus had stolen something, Onesimus runs away, 
somehow meets Paul, gets baptized, and now is sent back with this glowing recommendation of the Apostle Paul. Like, how does this even happen? Philemon might be wondering. You think about naturally the way that this would reflect on Philemon. Here is one of the leaders of the ecclesia, yet members of his own household are so discontented that they're running away. What does that say about the leadership of Philemon in the presence of those around him or the presence of his fellow land or slave owners? What would this do if, if he didn't discipline this slave, if he didn't discipline Onesimus for running away? Would this empower other people to do something similar? What was the incentive for sticking around if you could run away, have the possibility of meeting the Apostle Paul and come back with this immunity letter? You could imagine these feelings and emotions going through your mind as somebody has wronged you. And as Philemon is trying to weigh out what he should do in this particular situation, what was he going to do as he thought about the message that Paul was communicating to him? And perhaps that's why in the letter to Colossians, there's a disproportionate amount of advice in Colossians chapter 3 and 4 about the way that slaves and masters are supposed to interact. In the case of the other two examples that are expounded in great deal in the book of Ephesians, Paul simply gives the summary of how it is that a husband and wife should interact and a child and parent should interact. But he gives the full explanation as to how servants and masters should interact in the book of Colossians, perhaps because of this very unique and specialized issue that Philemon and Onesimus were going through. It sounds very similar to the parable of the lost sons in Luke 15, doesn't it? Of where a son takes, runs away, consumes the living, comes to his right mind, and wants to return home. And the question to Philemon is, how would he receive this lost son who is now coming home? Would he show the spirit of Christ, or would he show a different spirit? This would have weighed heavy on Philemon as he thought about the pros and cons, what was the right thing to do, and how he should make that decision. And as he's pondering this, thinking deeply and perhaps with Onesimus standing before him, having delivered the letter for Philemon to read, Paul gives Philemon a reputation to live up to in verses 20 to 21. Paul reiterates in verse 20 his desire to experience joy from the decision-making of Philemon. He's encouraging Philemon to make the right decision, to think about what the right thing is. Then he wants to experience the joy of Philemon deciding of himself through prayer and consideration to make the right decision. And he says in verse 21 that he's confident. He's confident that Philemon will do the right thing. He's giving him a reputation to live up to. I know you can make the right decision. And just as you've refreshed the bowels of others, please, brother, please do the same for me in verse 21, knowing that you will do also more than I say. But what does that mean, to do more than he says? Perhaps he was hoping that Philemon would send Onesimus back to Rome to minister to Paul on Philemon's behalf. Or perhaps he was suggesting that Philemon should emancipate Onesimus and give him his freedom, even though he doesn't come out right and ask for that. Whatever the case may be, he expresses confidence that Philemon is going to do the right thing. He says that just as though Philemon would do the right thing, he would go above and beyond. And he continues speaking toward the end of this letter to conclude with the blessings of God in verses 22 to 25 that he gives them the salutations of other brethren with him, who presumably were also hopeful that Philemon would do the right thing. And so Paul begins with the positive. He ends with the positive and inserts a constructive appeal in between those two positives. So what happens then? What's the outcome of this letter? Is it successful in procuring reconciliation between these two brethren? Does Onesimus return to Rome? Well, there doesn't seem to be any evidence that Onesimus returns to Rome because when we come to 2 Timothy, there's no mention of Onesimus being with Paul in Rome during his second imprisonment. Paul is very specific about who remains with him. And even those who were once with him that have left, Paul mentions. 
For example, he mentions Demas in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 16 as being an individual that forsook him, despite Demas being specifically mentioned in both Colossians and Philemon as somebody who was with him. And so if Onesimus was with him, he seems like he would have been mentioned in some regard. But does that mean then that Philemon received Onesimus as a brother? Well, we're not really told that either. But we would hope that given the reputation of Philemon, that he would do that, that he would follow the counsel of Paul, that he would continue to show loving care for the brethren in accepting Onesimus. But perhaps the wisdom of the Spirit has withheld that understanding from us, such that we might focus on the process of reconciliation and the steps involved, because it's by following the process and demonstrating the right spirit that we get to the result. And some of these questions, as we know, will need to be answered in the kingdom. But as we think about our own issues and our own opportunities, one with the other, let's reflect on some of the things that Paul has said as he constructively appealed to both Philemon and Onesimus to work together and to reconcile their differences. In the case of Paul's appeal, he lovingly appeals versus making a bold demand. And no matter how strongly we feel about something, how strongly we feel that we know the right pathway forward, a loving appeal is always received better than a bold demand. When he does address the issue, he addresses it directly. He doesn't try to skirt it. He doesn't downplay it. He acknowledges reality for what it is. And he even presents the position of Philemon, that Onesimus was totally useless to him before. But just because we acknowledge reality doesn't mean that we need to wallow in it. And what he does is he steps forward from the past tense to the present tense and says that he knows that despite the past that Onesimus has changed and he cites evidence of what has and what will change and the importance for us in doing that moving forward. To yes, be apologetic, to be sorry for what's taken place, but to think given that, what might success look like? How might we move forward together in being able to grow beyond this issue that's facing us presently. And when we make an appeal, even though we ourselves may have worked through things for a period of time, the person that we're presenting that to may not have had the same amount of time to consider that. This may be something new that they're thinking about. And we've been ruminating on something for months, and we present it to them and think that they're going to make a split-second decision. We see the counsel here to give somebody else the time to think the time to decide, the time to pray about it, and to consider what the right steps are moving forward, and to not force a decision when we would like a decision or when we think it's convenient. And where possible, to refocus each other's minds on the providence of God, to look for ways of where God might be using that situation, as Paul suggests here, to not be forceful about it and say, well, I know this is why this is happening. It's because you did that, that, and that, and Here's what God's trying to teach you about all the things that you've done wrong. Paul simply says, perhaps he departed for a season. Here's a suggestion of how God might be working through this situation, Philemon. And it's helpful for us to elevate each other's thinking. And as we're talking to each other, it's important for us to personally invest in the success of our brothers and sisters. To not just be a consultant who gives advice and steps out, but to really put ourselves in that situation as Paul did here, saying that he would even give of himself to make sure that this debt was forgiven and to give each other a positive reputation to live up to, to not expect the worst from each other, but to hope for the best and to try to inspire each other to reach forward toward it and to conclude with the blessing of God as he prays for God's grace to be with them. And so we see the counsel to begin with the positive, to constructively appeal and to finish with the positive, and in so doing, to pursue peace one with the other. This is the counsel that we receive through the Spirit and the divine pattern that's presented to us of how we can look for the positive, how we can constructively appeal one toward the other, and how we can work through the differences that we have in this present time. Because as we look around the room here, and in our ecclesias back home, and even in the brotherhood, there is one body of Christ, and we're expected to work together in the spirit of unity to try to resolve our differences and to make sure that 
even though we may run into hurdles and it may feel like we're hitting brick walls, to never give up, to keep reaching forward toward the kingdom, to try to inspire each other to do the right thing, to pray for God's help, and to work together in the spirit of Christ that we might pursue grace, we might pursue peace, and by God's help might attain unto it.